Today, I want to kind of get you to think about uh, this resurrection and why the cross was so important as we talked about it last week. Uh, and we considered the question, who is this man? John Ortberg wrote a book entitled, Who is This Man? Uh, a few years ago, uh, and it's powerfully moving because of the way Jesus just finds a way in ordinary people as he interacts with them to make a change in their life where people just say, who is this man? And I hope today we kind of flesh that out a little bit in our own lives. You can be turning your Bibles over to John chapter 3. We'll be in John a couple of different places, so you, you will hang there as I jump around a little bit, but you won't have to go to every, all those other places. A uh, young couple named Scott and Leslie got married. They were excited uh, uh, and as they were getting ready for their wedding. They have a big wedding. They had this great uh, reception, as we often plan afterwards, to, to celebrate, and they have a lot of family and friends all around them. And, and as they're there uh, celebrating and finally get ready to leave and they get the bubbles or the rice or the, or the bird seed or whatever we want to do today as we send off the, the happy couple, uh, they finally get on the road. And, and Scott's made these wonderful, uh, wonderful plans for their honeymoon at this real uh, fancy hotel. And he has booked the honeymoon suite. And, and so when they finally get there in the wee hours of the night and get checked in, they go up to their room and, and they walk in, and there's the living room type, and, and there's a couch, uh, there's a little table off to the side, and, and a coffee pot, uh, there's a lamp, and there's a bathroom, but the one thing they noticed was not there was a bed, you know? And so as they're in their, in their thinking and looking around, they find out that the couch was a, was a pull-out bed. And, and so it was so late in the night, and they were both ex extremely tired. Uh, they finally just go to bed, and they spend their first night as a married couple in, in this frumpy old pull-out couch with this knotted-up mattress and these saggy old springs. And you can imagine when Scott is trying to plan something so wonderful for his new bride, the next morning, the first thing he does is he gets up and heads straight down to the front desk to give this clerk, this person, whoever it may be, a piece of his mind. And so he begins to say, what kind of place is this that I tell you I'm going to be getting married to make reservations months in advance, and you tell me you're going to give me the honeymoon suite, and, and then there's not even a bed in our room. And the guy said, did you open the bedroom door? <laughs> and then they're getting in so late in the night and thinking about it. Scott sees a door, and he assumes it's a closet and never opens the door. But it, he goes back to his room, and sure enough, he opens the door, and there's this giant king-sized bed, and there's chocolates, and there's roses, and, and, and there's a, a bottle of champagne uh, already in there. They had never opened the door. It was all there for him. He just never took chance to an opportunity to seize it and, and know what was going on. And some doors are just too important to leave closed. You know, after uh, Jesus has been crucified, we find that the disciples are huddled in a room, locked inside, uh, because Jesus has been killed. He's gone to a cross, they've crucified him, and they assume that because there's they're followers of him that there, there will be next, and so they're, they're hiding and fearful of their own life. And all along, there's something great taking place as Jesus is resurrected. And if they remain in that room, they may miss out on the greatest experience of anyone's life. And so today, I want you to consider maybe some things that took place in that room and why. You know, uh, thousands of years ago, six events took place that, in, in 12 hours that changed who we are in our world permanently. Let me just briefly give you the rundown of what these events were. Number one, we talked about them last year around this time, that, that, that Jesus was betrayed by Judas. A good, dear friend betrayed him and turned his back on him. He was forsaken by his other friends, if you can remember, uh, Peter saying, I don't know the man, and his own friends that were with him in the garden take off and run, and they, they go away. His followers begin to deny him. Thousands of people have been following Jesus all along, and now when it's time, when Jesus dies, there's only 12 left. He's tried by his accusers. He's tortured by the Roman guards. And he's crucified by those who will be known as his enemies. That's a lot to take in, isn't it? Why did God allow those things to take place? Why 
Why would he have to go through such things? I want to talk about that as today as we think, consider that. We're going to talk about maybe two of the most important questions that any of us will ever have to think about in life. What really happened on the cross? And secondly, if I really get what happened on the cross, what difference and what change will that make in my life? You see, there's a big difference in the way I should be living if I believe what happened on the cross made any difference in the history of the world. Remember, I asked you to turn over John chapter 3, probably the most famous verses in Scripture. John chapter 3, verse 16, and followed by verse 17, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's Christianity summarized in just a few short words, isn't it? You ever had to tell somebody your story? You had to tell somebody how you know Jesus, and 30 minutes later you still hadn't told them how you ever found Christ. Boy, if we could just learn to condense it down to 30 seconds. People say, you know what? That man or that woman, they know the Lord. That's what took place in these couple of verses. We find that the gospel is going to be spelled out. The good news, that's what gospel means. In, this, in, in this, this very passage, you know, God's only son perished eternal life. You find it all right there. That's the good news. Max Lucado wrote about the cross in his book, <clears throat> No Wonder They Call Him the Savior. Listen to his words. He says, the cross. It rests on the timeline of history like a compelling diamond. Its tragedy summons all suffers. Its absurdity abstracts. All cynics it says it hopes, its hopes lure all searchers. History has idolized it and despised it, gold plated it and burned it, worn it and trashed it. History has done everything to, to it but ignore it. So that's the one option that the cross does not offer. No one can ignore it. You, you can't ignore a piece of lumber that suspends the greatest claims in history. Its bottom line is sobering. If, if the account is true, it is history's hinge, period. If not, it's a hoax. That's why the cross and what it is matters. Wow. You and I have to determine whether we believe the cross. We, do, we, do we understand what really took place? Does it make a difference in our life? And if it did, did it really change history? You see, on the cross we find that God's passion for people is unveiled. Do you understand God loves you? I mean, you hear it all the time. You're here at the church today. And the preacher's already said, God loves you. People have been praying, God, we thank you that you love us. We love you back. But do we really love him? Do we understand the passion that God has for us? That's the big challenge that each, of, each one of us has to deal with. If you flip over in your scriptures there in John chapter 19, we'll look at three different people that are going to be at the foot of the cross when Jesus dies. We read about these people and we understand God's passion for us as he reveals it in those individuals. We find in John 19, verses 25 through 27, it says, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Oh, so we can consider this then. If we understand anything about the cross, we have to find out that the cross is going to be a place of redemption that takes place. Probably one of the most unlikely people you would find there at the crucifixion of Jesus is going to be Mary Magdalene. Now, if you know anything about Mary Magdalene, you find out that, that she's probably not a person that would have been a diehard follower of Jesus, but we read in Luke chapter 8 about Mary Magdalene being a woman who has had seven demons cast out of her. And as a result of that, as the demons lived in her and worked in her, we find out that she was a person who basically was a woman of the street. And, and, and Satan had had his way with her so much, and, and had, she had done things that many of us probably could never even think of doing in our life. And she had been in bondage all those, all those years in her life. And Jesus sets her free. And so if anybody should be at the foot of the cross, and she knows how, what it means to be set free and be redeemed, it would be Mary Magdalene. And so she is there with Jesus' mother and a few other ladies and John. 
You see, Satan's done everything he could in Mary Magdalene's life to destroy her both emotionally and spiritually. And the people sitting in this room today, you're going through that yourself. Satan's doing everything he can to tear you apart emotionally so he can break your spirit. And eventually what he's looking really to do is to destroy your faith. That's what he was trying to do in her life. I want you to think about how she was. I mean, she found herself in a hopeless and helpless situation. And yet Jesus sets her free. The Apostle Paul would put it this way in Acts chapter 26, verse 18. And as he considers the work of Christ in people's lives, he said he came to open their eyes to turn them from the darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in him. Wow. Now that's powerful words, isn't it? The cross is a place of exchange for many of us. I mean, you consider what takes place. You go from darkness to light. You, you, you go from this place of weakness to power. You have this understanding that I no longer have to live in guilt, but I can transfer that over to God's grace. I can exchange past failures for hope of a future. That's what God wants to give us. That's what Jesus did for Mary Magdalene. That's the reason we find her at the foot of the cross. Now, I have to say this to myself. What difference does God's forgiveness mean to me in 2016? Why would he love me? I mean, what difference would it have to, to, to make in his life that he would want to die for me all these years later? I can imagine Jesus if he's in the garden. And he's there and he's having to pray and pray for me. And, he, and, and I can imagine him saying, God, is there any other way that this person right here could... Could, could get into heaven except I die and go, go to a cross for them and have to deal with all that suffering. And I have to understand what all that sin and, and, and that pain is about. Uh, is there any way to pay for them? And God just looks at him and says, you know, there's no way. Uh, you know sin's never going to enter heaven. It can't be where I am. Somebody's got to pay for that man's sin. And so as a result of that, I stand before you today. Preaching the gospel because I understand. I understand that it's a real thing. That redemption took place on the cross. It didn't take place simply so I could stand up here and say, I've got a good story to tell. But redemption took place in my life. And so I have to do, as we've already mentioned through prayers, share with somebody that Jesus can change you. If he changed me. Now that's love. Do you understand what it means to be loved by God? Who is this man that would do such a thing? At the foot of the cross, we, we find a place of relationships as well. A few years ago, Ford Magazine, they, they called some of the leaders of America's largest churches. And, and, and so they, one of the things they wanted to find out was how CEOs of large corporations could learn uh, some things from pastors of large congregations. How were they so successful? And many times working with volunteers and with most of the churches. Here's the question they asked. What is the most important thing that you've learned in the last 10 years of ministry? And the answer many of them gave them, here's the solution. The solution to everything is the right person. Wow. The solution to everything. You can consider that. Go back and read First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles in the Bible. And, and when Israel was going through a period of good time, they had a right leader. When they had a bad leader, they went through a bad time. Now transfer that over to the New Testament. The solution to everything is not the right religion or the right ritual. The solution to everything is a relationship with the right person. And that right person is Jesus Christ. That's what Christians believe. That's what we hang our hat on. Today, if somebody walks in there and says, Jesus is dead, I don't know why you're all here. You've got to decide today whether you would stand up and say, Jesus is alive, or you get up and walk out with the person who says he is, he's still dead. You see, you've got to decide whether you are in a relationship with a living, breathing person. There's the challenge each one of us deal with. And so we find that there at the foot of the cross, Jesus' mother's there. And here's what we see her dealing with. She's suffering because of how Jesus died. 
I mean, you consider all the pain he went through. He's on a cross. And he's been through this method of capital punishment that has been used at that time. And, and, and he's dying between two common thieves as we experienced last week. And so she died, she's suffering herself because of how he died and also where he died. He's out in the public. I mean, he's being put on for exhibition. And it's not bad enough if he had to die because he was actually a criminal or a thief or a murderer. But here's an innocent man having to be portrayed as someone like that. It may be in your life, and it may be in your faith. You've been confronted with who Jesus is and the world that you're living in and the people you're dealing with. And you've got to acknowledge you're in a relationship with him or you're not. You can't say, well, that's what you believe. You go at it. This is what I believe. I'm fine with that. At some point in time, somebody's going to confront you with the reality that, that, that is Jesus God? And if he is, why do you follow him? And you need to say, I follow him because I've had a relationship with him since September of 1996. That's where he found me. What about you? Are you in a relationship with Christ? Remember what took place there. The scripture says when, in John 19, verses 26 and 27, when, when Jesus saw his mother there and disciple whom, whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here's your son, and to the disciple, here's your mother. Now, what was Jesus saying? I mean, that, that, that they were in a relationship with him, but now he wants them in a relationship with one another. So at the foot of the cross, not only do we find a relationship with Christ, but we find out in the cross that we have a relationship. There's this bond between you and I. And we need one another. Here's what Paul would say in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body. And each member belongs to the other. Because of the cross, we're all part of Christ's body. We're in a relationship with him, and we're in a relationship with one another. There's no way around it. That's the reason Jesus went to us. But he also gives us some responsibilities. I think too many people today want to say, I got Jesus, and that's all I need. Remember earlier I told you about the little comic strip that was sent to me about the fellow who comes out of the church with his wife and he shakes the preacher's hand and says, Preacher, I think you're slipping a little bit. Every time I come to church, you always preach about the resurrection. He had just enough Jesus, he thought, to get himself saved. And I think for too many of us today, that's where we are. We, we, we fail to remember that now that we're in this relationship, we have responsibilities to God and we have responsibilities to one another. Now, consider this. He also gives his disciple, who he loves, John, some responsibility and some things to carry out. I mean, here's what he says. He says, woman, here's your son, and to the disciple, here's your mother. Now, a lot of us get this woman fuzzy feeling and say, well, it's good that he was there, and he could put us up, yeah, I'm going to take care of him. When my daddy died, before he died, a couple of weeks, he, he says, Son, I, 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 I feel bad I haven't done more for your mama than what I, I should have. I didn't prepare for her the way I should. I, uh, I, when my dad died, uh, he, he had no life insurance. He had no money to bury himself. It was left up to uh, my family to take care of him, me and my wife, my mama. And, and, and he said, he says, I've not left her anything. And when we packed her up uh, in the place that they were living, uh, we hauled everything she owned out van that's sitting out there in the parking lot right now I took the two back seats out and laid the two middle seats down and everything that she owned in 40 years of marriage went in the back of that car that's where he left her his attitude in life was I came into the world with nothing and that's the way I'm leaving with nothing and I ain't leaving nobody nothing that's fine but you should take care of those God's entrusted you to take care of but it broke his heart when he realized that's the actual state. He always made a joke about it, but it, he realized that his heart was broken when it was time for him to know that his last days were here, that he had done nothing, and he had provided nothing. And he set me down. He says, come sit down and talk to you. Will you take care of your mama? 
Hmm? Now, I could have been made him feel good and said, yeah, Daddy, don't worry about it. I'll take care of Mama and never done anything for her from that point on. Or I have to step up and say, yeah, she's my mama. I'm going to take care of her. That's what Jesus has done right here with John. He says, woman, here's your son. Son, here's your mother. And look at the wording of the scriptures. It, he didn't say, yeah, that sounds good. I'll do that. I love you, Jesus. I love her. Yeah, anytime she needs me. You know, you ever, your kids got God parents. You know, the, the, the theory behind that originally was if something happens to me, this person right here is going to take my kids and raise them as their own. I don't have to worry about it. Somebody's going to take care of it. This is the person they're going to go to. And that used to be the way it was. Now it's all just pageantry and show. Would you be my child's godmother? Would you be my child's godfather? We want to think they're like Disney. Bibbidi. Boppity, boo. Show up once in a great while. That's not what took place, is it? The Bible says that John took it so seriously and this relationship and this responsibility, he says that from that time on, this is where it starts. It never finished until it was time for her to go be with the Lord or him to meet the Lord. From that time on, he said he took her into his home. Now, it's also, as we meet the cross, we find out not only was it for John, but it's a responsibility for other people. I mean, you, you find out in Mark chapter 15, verse 21, it says, A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. How about that? Jesus says this in John chapter 20, As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. God has got some great responsibilities for us. Will you accept them? Now, if you understand that, you're getting the message of the cross, that should give you a new confidence toward God, shouldn't it? You should be willing to say, I I'm confident in your love for me, God, because I saw what Jesus did. I'm confident, God, in your grace because I know I don't deserve this, and I'm confident in your power that you have raised Jesus from the dead. Well, let's just consider his love for a minute. The Bible says that we love because he first loved us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. I love what Eugene Peterson writes in the message in 1 Peter chapter 3. What a God we have. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And that future starts now. Wow. That's love, isn't it? God loved us enough to give us that. Consider God's grace. I mean, a lot of people try to deny God's grace. They want all about the love, and they want all about the forgiveness, but they don't understand why it had to come about, and so they deny the grace that came through Jesus. They want to say it's a lie, and yet in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace. How about that? With confidence. We can have a confidence toward God. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That means we can live free of guilt. Have you figured out that guilt is just a really a life killer? Hmm. Have you gotten there yet in your life? I mean, it puts us in a place of punishment on a daily basis, doesn't it? You feel so guilty about things that you feel like you're daily being punished about something. And if it's not for God's grace that can release you from that, you will die in that same way. Guilt paralyzes us. It gets us to the point where we feel like we're just locked in a prison. Guilt will rob you of joy. It will rob you of your energy. It will rob you of your confidence. And eventually, guilt will rob you of your faith. If God really loved me, why do I still feel this way? I don't know that God even exists. 
Eugene Peterson, Second, Second Chronicle, uh, Corinthians chapter 5. And from the message, it says, God put the world square with him, uh, self through the Messiah, giving the world, uh, world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sin. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. How, you ask? In Christ. God put the wrong on him who, who never did anything wrong so that we could be put right with God. That's grace. He put the wrong that we did on him so that we could be right with him. You remember I've told you often that when God looks at me, though I am flawed and I have my mistakes and I'm ugly and everything else, when God looks at me, he sees a reflection of his son, Jesus. And that's why when it's time to see him face to face, I can approach him boldly with confidence saying, I belong to your son. And I believe Jesus is going to be right there saying, he's mine. There he is. Warts and all, he's mine. And God says, that's not who I saw to start with. I saw you. God's always working. In my life, I see him continually working in me. And I know in your life, you should be able to see him continually working through you. Notice what happened after the resurrection. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible says, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, notice it wasn't just this one-time event where he, he shows up. Because if it had just been a one-time event, look, how many people have seen Elvis? Hmm? There's a whole theology. I'm talking about after he died. <clears throat> called Elvisology. I saw Elvis. He was over there. I saw Elvis eating pancakes over at the pancake house. I saw Elvis here. I saw Elvis there. I saw Elvis down here. I saw Elvis. He was at my house. I mean, everybody's seen Elvis. But that's not what took place with Jesus. That's not what took place at all. I mean, we got Elvis impersonators everywhere. There weren't a lot of Jesus impersonators in that day. You know why? Because Jesus wasn't very popular at the time. And if they thought they saw him, they would have took him and put him back on the cross. And yet Scripture says that he appeared to them over 40 days. And he gave them many convincing proofs that he was who he says he was. You, you see, if it had only been a one-time thing, he could have showed up and said, Surprise! Here I am! It's like a birthday party. Everybody jumps out. Surprise! You see all the cars in the yard, you know that all them folks got to be around there somewhere. But you got to go in and go, oh, you here for me? What? I was wondering why my lampshades were moving. Maybe for some it could have been a vision. Maybe for others they could have said, I saw Jesus. They said, no, you, look, when my daddy died, I saw him. I dreamed about him. But he wasn't real. I couldn't put my hands on him. I couldn't touch him. But in my mind at that time, I thought he was alive. That was just a dream. But the Bible says that Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem for 40 days. And he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. And that he told them things about the kingdom because he wanted them to be a part of the kingdom. Now, back in those days, historians and architects would tell us that there probably lived about a quarter of a million people in Jerusalem. And, and within 20 years after the resurrection, in that city alone, there were between 100,000 and 125,000 Christians. That means half the people that lived there became followers of Jesus. Why? Because they, many of those people were still living and they had seen him. Not because somebody said, I heard that Jesus fellow was still alive. I'm sure that there had been people who had encountered that, but they'd say, you know what? I was walking the other day. Come here, I want to show you something. And he grabbed something about the arm. <clears throat> you know that guy they killed on the cross, Jesus? There he is. That's what was taking place. Go over there and listen to what he's got to say. 
And he gave them convincing proofs of what was taking place. Now, if that took place, you and I need to have confidence toward God that he can do anything in our life that he wants to do because he did that with Jesus. But it also should give us a, a healthy fear of sin. And the problem with the world today, Jimmy mentioned it earlier, if it was money God wanted, we could buy all the faith in the world. To, unfortunately, that's not happening. That's not exactly what God wants. He wants our faith. And then to have our faith, that means we've got to understand the difference between right and wrong and to trust Him even when it seems like the wrong way is the easiest way. And we should fear sin. Jesus said in John 17, I, give, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not in, of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. That was a story many years ago I received from a preacher friend of mine <clears throat> about a man that was uh, working, and every day he had to come out where, from where he worked, and he passed pass through a gate, and he would be pushing a wheelbarrow full of sand. And so the guards that were there had to search through the sand thinking he was stealing stuff. And so every day he would leave and he'd be pushing a wheelbarrow of sand. They'd stop and they would sift all through the sand to see if there was anything in it. They'd let him go on. And finally, after several days, they said, where is he getting all these wheelbarrows? And they realized it wasn't stuff in the dirt he was stealing. He was actually stealing wheelbarrows. You see, sometimes in life, we, we, we want to think that it's okay to get by with certain things. I mean, you consider our government today. Uh, we're over here doing this one thing, and then yet we're out there shaking hands and kissing babies over there make us look like we're a lot better than we really are. There, there are places where leaders just selectively obey the laws. You know, we're supposed to be looking up to them, and they should be setting an example for us. And so the, if the example we're seeing is that it's okay to sin when we want to, to disobey the law when we want to, and hold on to only the ones that we think that apply to us, there's our problem. Ecclesiastes 8.11 says this, When a crime is not punished quickly, people feel it's safe to do wrong. I think you and I need to understand that sin is sin wherever you find it and whatever it is. Well, if it's in my life or it's in your life, the individual greatest need in our time is a need for integrity. And the only place you're going to find integrity is the one who is right, and that's Jesus. Pa Paul said this, After all, the old life has died with Christ and on the cross so that our sinful selves would have no no power over us, and we would not be slaves to sin. God wants to do something with you. God is looking to change you. The cross event made a big difference because of what Christ was trying to do. He is trying to reconcile himself to the world, and he wants to reconcile us to him. Paul would write 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Didn't mean so we could continue to do everything we wanted to do wrong. And he was committing to us the message of recon reconciliation. God wants you to be right. That's what reconciling is all about. Right with one another. Right with God. Let me ask you today, is that where you are? Are you right with the world? You know, the world we're living in today is people are all out there today. They're probably sitting home watching whatever they want to watch. They're reading newspapers. They're online. They're doing whatever they want to do because it's Sunday and I've got to go to work tomorrow. And after all, I already know Jesus. Is that right? Do you? Is that all he means to you? You see, God put the church here for a reason. That's what the ministry is all about. That's why we have these young people sitting down front sharing them about the love of Christ. That's why we're out there in the community finding various ways to serve people because we know the world is lost and they need Christ. And, and if people's lives don't mean any more than whatever they're doing this morning outside of trying to follow Jesus, then we're failing. 
Because if we know that people around us are dying without Christ, then that person, for him, the death of Christ was wasted. And it was worthless. And our responsibility to Christ has been neglected. So where do you find yourself? The reason I preach Jesus this morning is because I have a responsibility to him to share with you how much he loves you. The reason I share with, about Christ this morning is because I know the life-changing events that have taken place in me. And I know the things that he's still accomplishing. And I'm looking forward to what my life holds. What about you?